There's a passage in the canon that connects the teachings on aging, illness, and death with the three teachings that we chanted just now, body and constancy, stress, not self. The king, Garavya, is talking to Ratapala, a monk, and asking Ratapala why he had ordained. The king felt that most people ordain because of a loss in the family, loss of wealth, sickness, some disaster. But none of those things applied in Ratabala's case. So Ratabala talks about the four Dharma summaries. The world is swept away, it does not endure. A teaching on inconstancy, and he illustrates it with aging. He asks the king, were you, when you were young, were you strong? And the king says, yes, I thought I had the strength of two people. How about now? Well, now I'm 80 years old, and sometimes I intend to put my foot in one place and it goes someplace else. So aging is the main inconstancy teaching. The world has no shelter. That was another reason Ratabala ordained. The king asked him the meaning of that. Ratabala says, do you have any recurring illnesses. And the king says, yes, I have a recurring wind illness, which would be you know, shooting pains in the body. And when you have this illness, can you ask your courtiers to share out some of the pain so you don't have to suffer so much? And he says, no, I can't do that. And I have to take all the pain on my own. So illness is the dukkha teaching on suffering and stress. third Dharma summary, the world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The king says, I have a lot of stuff. What do you mean the world has nothing? And Ratabala says, well, when you die, can you take that with you? And the king says, no, of course not. So death is the ultimate not-self teaching, the things we hold on to as us and ours. Yeah, they don't leave us before we die, they leave us when we die. So when you think about those three perceptions, inconstantly stress and not self, always think about what lies behind them, aging, illness, and death. And learn to think of these things as normal. There's that other chant that we do very often. I'm subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. I've not gone beyond these things. The Thai translation, I am subject to these things, can also be translated as, these things are normal. Aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. It's happening all the time. But we suffer because of that fourth Dharma summary, we're slave to craving. We keep coming back for more and more and more of the same old aging, illness, and death. And John Fuhrman once said that the central pleasures that we hunger for are things that we've had in the past. We miss them. We want them again. And we forget about all the suffering that goes on around those things. Of course, the fact that we're missing them now so intently. means that when we gain them again, we're going to lose them again and suffer again, just as intensely. The question is, when are you going to have enough? In the king's case, he had no sense of enough at all. He already had a kingdom, and Ratabal asked him, if someone came and told you there was a kingdom to the east that you could conquer, would you conquer it? And the king said, of course. Someone comes from the south, the west, the north with the same news. There are kingdoms all around that the king could conquer. Does he want more? Of course. What if someone were to come from the other side of the ocean? There's a kingdom over there you could conquer. Would you take it? And the king says, of course. And although we may not be thinking about kingdoms, our craving keeps us going. And the question always comes down to, when have you had enough? 
When would you like to look someplace else for your happiness? Of course, all of us have an inkling of that at least. That's why we're here meditating. We look inside instead of outside for our a happiness that will be satisfying. Now the problem is that sometimes things get really nice inside and there's a sense of ease and well-being. We start getting complacent. The world isn't such a bad place after all. I actually heard one Dharma teacher talk about what she called the third and a half noble truth. It was that maybe you can't end suffering, but at least you can manage it. It's okay. And it's that attitude that keeps people coming back. So you really want to look inside. Where are you pinning your hopes for happiness? Those coyotes howling. They say the ones who howl are the ones who are frustrated in their desires. At least we human beings can have opportunity to look at our desires and decide how much we want to follow them. We're not quite so driven, but we don't have to be. Many of us are. But we have the option to step back, look at our greed, our aversion, delusion, look at our pride, and ask ourselves, are these the things that are going to take us to happiness? Can we really trust them? This is why one of the Buddhist most basic teachings is on the topic of refuge. We have examples of people who have stepped back from their, their cravings and freed themselves from that slavery. And the news of these people should shake us up. We may have doubts about how far they really put an end to suffering, or how far they can go, or how far we could go. But at least we owe it to ourselves to ask the question, what would it be like not to have to follow our cravings? And here's a teaching that offers a possibility, it offers a path. This is what you do. The steps are all laid out. But at least it offers a way out. One of the big misrepresentations of the teaching is that it's pessimistic. But the idea that just coming back again and again and again would be enough, would be okay. Or they just put up with things as they are, and you know, the third and half noble truth, suffering is manageable, that's okay. That's the pessimistic approach, that this is as good as it gets. You might as well learn how to accept it. As the Buddha said, the secret to his awakening was that he wouldn't rest content with skillful qualities if they hadn't taken them all away. So on the one hand, you accept the fact that this is where you are. You don't try to deny the situation, but you also accept the fact that it could be better. And the Buddha gives you that example, that there is a way out. And so we should take his example as our refuge. That's our protection. It's so easy to shove him off. Blank him out of our minds. 
Yet when we do that, who are we benefiting? We're not benefiting ourselves, we're not benefiting the people around us. So you always want to keep him in mind. That's the other meaning of sarana. On the one hand it means refuge, on the other hand it means something that you keep recollecting. Keep recollecting his example. This is what human beings can do. Recollect the Dharma. This is the guidance he offered. Now we can find that freedom. Recollect the Sangha. The Noble Sangha have shown that it wasn't just the Buddha who could do this thing. They applied his teaching to their lives, to their hearts. Found that they gained the same freedom. So you always want to keep that possibility of freedom in your mind. As you make your choices as you go through life, try to make the choices that go in that direction. So you can learn what it's like to not to be pulled around by the nose by craving. Have at least a taste of what freedom would be like. It's only when you've had that first genuine taste that you can really trust yourself. That even though you'd be making mistakes and still may not be totally free from defilement, at least you know that there is a way out, it's for sure. So there's no pessimism in the Buddhist teachings. He offers the possibility of a totally unfettered happiness. That's as good as it gets. And it's a lot better than things are right now. So let's keep that in mind.